High Adventure. For most people, Christmas is a time of warm family reunions, parties, and a chance to celebrate the fundamentals of Christianity. But not everyone's that lucky, as in tonight's story by Roger Service, which he calls Silent Night, Deadly Night. Evening, Sparks. Evening, Skipper. Uh, anything interesting coming through? Uh, oh, there is for wardroom steward O'Donoghue. Oh, what? Uh, he's the father of a bouncing boy. Eight pounds, two ounces. Well done, that man. <laughs> Anything else? Oh, well, half a dozen personal messages for crewmen, sir. Nothing through the bridge. I don't know what the ruddy navy is coming to. Admiralty signals for the benefit of ordinary seamen. <laughs> Begging your pardon, sir. You could hardly call anyone on board vigilant ordinary. <laughs> Point taken, Sparks. But I still think some of the navy's traditions are dying a little too easily. <laughs> Perhaps you're right, sir. You know, when I was a boy, going to sea meant just that. Going to sea. No contact with friends and family for months on end. None of this molly coddling you get today. Well, I dare say in those days, no one would have believed we'd elect a female prime minister either. Well, at least said about that. <laughs> uh, bridge radio. Uh, yes, he is. It's for you, sir. Chief Engineer Roberts. Oh, thanks. Yes, Chief. Can we be sure about this? I see. When can we be certain? Uh, I'll stay right here. Let me know as soon as you can. Anything wrong, Skipper? I can't be sure for the moment, Sparks, but the Chief's just reported a warning signal from the engine room. A fire hazard, sir? Something rather worse than that, I'm afraid. Unless we have a malfunction of the automatic alarm system, we have a full-blown radiation leak from the reactor. Radiation leak? Shall I sound the emergency procedure alarm, sir? No, not yet. However well-drilled a crew may be, there's always a chance of panic faced with the real thing. I suppose it is the real thing. Aren't we wasting valuable time? Captain Turling. I see. Very well. Stand by. And God help us all. Bad, sir? Couldn't be worse, Sparks. A secondary Geiger reading confirms radiation leakage well above tolerable levels. What's to be done, sir? Sound emergency procedure alarm immediately. Yes, sir. And now activate the watertight doors and radiation shields. But, Skipper, we haven't given the men in the engine compartment time to clear it. I can't risk more contamination. Now do as I say. Yes, sir. What else can be done, sir? I recommend very fervent prayer. Jimmy Webb, and I'm the communications officer aboard Her Majesty's nuclear submarine Vigilant. She's the latest thing in submarine design and equal to anything the Americans or Russians can produce. She may not be as big as the Colossus of some 30,000 tons launched by the Russians, but at 18,000 tons she's the best we've got. She's fast, lethal, and capable of remaining submerged for up to six months. Though I uh, hate to think what state the crew would be in if she did. Well, here we are, Sparks. Sealed order's about to be opened, and you'll have the privilege of being the first to know. Captain Mark Sterling, the vigilant skipper. At 50, he's young for the job. Yeah, well, Sparks, there's some good news and some bad news. In 72 hours, we're taking vigilant on a maiden cruise to the South Seas. You mean the Pacific? <laughs> no, Sparks, unfortunately not. The South Atlantic. I see, sir. And bad news? We may not be back until after Christmas. That'll be a dampener on the lads. Oh, can't be helped, I'm afraid. It seems we're actually required to do something useful. Uh, am I permitted to inquire what it is, sir? Technically, no. Nevertheless, since you're bound to find out anyway, I can't see any harm in telling you. It seems there have been some inexplicable flashes in the South Atlantic recorded by American weather satellites. Inexplicable, sir? Inexplicable, yes. Unless. Unless what, sir? Well, I gather from these orders that both the Ministry of Defence and the CIA have reason to suspect that the South Africans are up to something down there. Oh, like what, sir? Well, according to those who ought to know, these flashes could only have been produced by nuclear detonations of some magnitude. You mean the South Africans might have developed nuclear weapons? Well, it's hardly my place to speculate on that, but um, logically, I'd say that if they've been able to produce the goods in so many other fields, and the best goods at that... Is there any reason to suppose they'd fail with nuclear armaments? And what are we supposed to do? Start another war with them? <laughs> Not at all. By way of putting Britain's latest and finest nuclear submarine through her paces on a long cruise, we're to uh, 
cruise the South Atlantic in a given area to see if we can throw more light on what the South Africans, if it's the South Africans, are doing down there. I see, sir. And supposing they, or anyone else, are blasting away with nuclear bombs, what happens to us? Neither Her Majesty nor Her Admiralty explained that to me, Sparks. But I imagine some good could come of it. Such as, sir? Well, you wouldn't have to worry about not knowing all the words to Jingle Bells anymore, (laughs) would you? (laughs) The next 72 hours were spent in a flurry of dockside activity on an around-the-clock basis at Plymouth. It was my unenviable task to round up all crew members away on 24 and 48 hour passes and give them the good news. I uh, naturally omitted the bit about not making it back for Christmas. Eventually, the time ran out as the submarine filled up with provisions and her crew. And finally, our matte black, sleek, menacing and deadly form slowly drew away from the quay and headed out into the grey, choppy waters washing our native island. Oh, the last 72 hours have worn me out, Sparks. I'm going to get my head down for a while. So unless it's important, see that I'm not disturbed. Aye, aye, sir. Despite her 18,000 tons, Vigilance living and working quarters were almost as cramped as on conventional submarines. From the communications room, the captain's quarters were reached through a door just far to the transmitter, while above me was the bridge, the nerve centre of it all. Scattered throughout the rest of the missile-shaped killer ship were some 90 officers and ratings, all going about their appointed tasks. A trifle grim-faced at the prospect of being on the other side of the globe for Christmas. In need of rest, myself, I left the communications desk in the hand of my number two and eased myself into my bunk. The vigilant boasted a cruise entertainment radio channel, run by off-duty personnel who fancied themselves as disc jockeys, some with warped senses of humour. And so, me hearties. You thought you'd be spending Christmas ashore in the arms of Kith and Kin and anyone else handy, did you? Well, you should know the Admiralty will protect you from such sinful things as drink, women and merrymaking. And here, just to take your mind off Christmas, snow scenes, holly, plum puddings and such like, is a little number expressly designed to help you. <laughs> Like I said, Vigilant wasn't short on warped humour, but I nevertheless shared the sentiment. I drew the line, though, at three Christmas carols in a row and decided to go up onto the cunning tower deck, since we were still travelling on the surface. Might as well save a fresh air while the going's good. No sleep for you, either, Sparks? No, sir. I thought I'd get a gulp or two of the real thing before the exercises begin. I don't blame you. Do we really have no idea how long we'll be away, Skip? I'm afraid not. I have orders to take us to a position in the South Atlantic and await further instructions. Oh, I hope we don't get into any sticky situations down there. What with an untried ship? Yeah, the war's in the Middle East, not the South Atlantic. Anyway, ours not to reason why. I thought that only applied to the army. <laughs> don't you believe it, lad? Yes, Sterling? Captain, radar room. Unidentified object approaching from near the head collision course. Range 800 yards and closing rapidly. Request instructions. 800 yards. Whatever it is should be visible. Can you make anything out, Sparks? Nothing at all, sir. Range 750 yards, sir. Instructions, please. Hard to starboard. Full power. Hard to starboard it is, sir. That should take us out of its path. Probably a ruddy trawler running without lights. Captain Sterling, we have object now bearing to port. Distance 500 yards. Yeah. Request instructions. Confounded idiots. 70 million pounds worth of submarine at risk because of some fools who don't know the rules of the channel. Still can't see anything, sir. Captain Sterling, his face set and grim, peered fruitlessly into the darkness. Somewhere out there was a boat, which perhaps even without knowing it, has thrown the most sophisticated warship ever created into panic. Captain Sterling, collision course confirmed. Request instructions urgently. Suddenly there was a brief parting in the dense overhead cloud which allowed the pale winter moon to momentarily bathe the scene before us in its anemic light. There it is! Look! Just for a moment, before the clouds blotted out the moon again, I glimpsed what looked like a pleasure cruiser at full throttle cutting across our port bow. Unless she veered off her present course by at least 90 degrees immediately, I could see no way that Vigilant could avoid running her down and possibly being damaged herself. Captain, radar confirms collision imminent. Object now 300 yards. Instructions, please. Captain Sterling seemed unable to speak. He stared ahead as if mesmerised by the imminent disaster. His face was ashen. I gripped his arm. Captain, do something! Yes. Yes, the only thing we can do. Attention all crew. 
Stand by for emergency crash dive. Sound the alarm. and I clambered down the hatches that began to close electrically. Two ratings swarmed up towards it from below to make good the seal manually. Vigilant, with all her complement at emergency stations, flooded her tanks and set her planes for crash dive. We reached the control room just as the flooded tanks and altered planes took effect. Her nose dropped away by perhaps as much as 50 degrees, and we had to grab hold of the console housing our radar and ASDIC to maintain our balance. Unbidden, the operator removed his headphones and turned up the ASDIC. The atmosphere was electrified with tension as those of us on the bridge waited rigid with unbridled fear to see whether disaster had been averted or not. We did it, Skipper. She's passing right overhead. Suddenly, brows were being mopped. Grins of relief were breaking out. The drama had passed. See to it that the incident is reported to Coastal Command, giving full details of position. Aye, aye, sir. What's our depth? After arresting the dive and levelling off, Vigilance Captain made his decision. Maintain our depth at 45 fathoms and resume original course. We're staying down here the rest of the way. Seems to me we'll be a damn sight safer. And so it was that Vigilant began her extended sea trials in earnest. She was put thoroughly through her paces, as were her crew, to ensure that she'd face any eventuality as the ultimate weapon she was. At the hitherto unheard of speed of something in excess of 40 knots, vigilant streaked silently through the chill depths of the Atlantic, heading for the position of the mysterious flashes. We reached the area at midnight on the 20th of December. At 300 hours, the vigilant surfaced. By 400 hours, a good many of the officers and men were on her conning tower to watch the firing of four missiles in quick succession, which was the prearranged signal to be relayed by satellite back to the Admiralty that we'd arrived. It was quite a sight. Countdown begins. Eight. Seven. The six, faintest blue grey wash in five, the sky heralded the dawn four, as the countdown was completed. Three. Two. One. Zero. Fire! done, Vigilant slid once more beneath the bleak Atlantic and awaited instructions. None came except to stand by and maintain position. We did, for five boring and uneventful days. It was early on Christmas Eve when the skipper inquired. Anything interesting coming through? Ah, uh, well, there is for wardroom steward old Donahue. He's the father of an eight-pound, two-ounce baby boy. Uh, well done, that man. <laughs> Anything else? Well, apart from half a dozen personal messages for the crew, no, sir. I don't know what the ruddy navy's coming to. Bridge? Yes, he is. It's for you, sir. Chief Engineer Roberts. Oh, well, thanks. Yes, Chief? Can we be sure about this? I see. When can we be certain? I'll remain here. Report as soon as you can. Something wrong, Skipper? I can't be sure for the moment, Sparks, but the Chief's just reported a warning signal from the engine room. Fire hazard, sir? Something more serious than that, I fear. Unless we have a simple malfunction of the automatic alarm concerned, we have a full-blown radiation leak from the reactor. Radiation leak? What, shall I sound the emergency procedure alarm, sir? No, not yet. However well-drilled a crew may be, there's always the risk of panic when faced with the real thing. But suppose it is the real thing, sir. Aren't we wasting valuable time? Sterling? It, I see. Very well. Stand by, and God help us all. Bad, sir? It couldn't be worse, Sparks. A secondary Geiger reading confirms radiation leakage well above tolerable levels. What's to be done, sir? Sound the emergency procedure alarm immediately. Yes, sir. Now, 
activate the watertight doors and radiation shields. But, Skipper, you haven't given the men in the engine compartment time to clear it. I've given them all the time I can afford. I can't risk more contamination. Now do as I say. Yes, sir. It was just on 0600 hours. I found myself thinking that this was one heck of a way to be spending Christmas Eve. All hands were now at their stations for emergency drill, with the exception of those still trapped in the engine compartment where the radiation leak had triggered the alarm. I'm going below to assess the situation. You get a mayday away immediately. I did. A serious view was taken of our plight because within minutes the Admiralty was on direct voice contact, advising that a Royal Navy rescue vessel was already altering course to render assistance. That was the good news. The problem was that she was some 18 hours away. Some minutes later, the captain, his brow beaded with perspiration, returned to the bridge. Have we... Have we had any response? Yes, sir. Help's on the way. 18 hours delay, though. What? All we have to do is surface and wait there. That's no blasted good to us, Mr. Webb. We're completely without engine power. And that means we're unable to vent our tanks. You mean we... I mean we can't bring the ship to the surface. We can do nothing but remain suspended where we are. 45 fathoms down in the Atlantic until we're either killed by radiation or lack of oxygen. Captain Sterling, his ship and crew were in deep trouble in more ways than one. I went below to the main working level and threaded my way through frightened pale faces to where the lead-lined radiation shield barred my way from entering the contaminated engine room. I found it chattering that there was nothing we could do for its occupants. Then the captain's voice was heard throughout the ship. Attention all hands. This is your captain. As you are aware, we have a crisis on our hands, but there is no cause for panic. At present, we appear unable either to surface or, in fact, do anything which requires engine power. I can tell you that help is on the way. In the meantime, kindly expend as little energy physically as possible. I couldn't help noticing that his last remark caused a number of raised eyebrows. As I passed the officer in charge of the depth regulators, he looked at me and shrugged his shoulders. The depth gauge read a steady 45 fathoms. At least we weren't sinking. I made my way back to the bridge, where I found the captain nervously twirling three fingers worth of neat scotch while staring at the dormant instruments. Pour yourself a drink, Sparks. Might as well. He looked at me, and I could see defeat written all over his face. I couldn't understand it. He'd had to take drastic action, which might have sealed the fate of the men in the engine room, whose fates were sealed anyway from radiation. But for the rest, it seemed to me purely a waiting matter. It wasn't the first time rescue from a hidden sub had taken place, after all. Maybe not, Sparks. The difference is that successful rescues take place where the oxygen hasn't run out. But the Vigilant produces its own, as well as fresh water, simply by breaking down seawater into hydrogen and oxygen. And we've provisions for more than six months. Oh, I don't understand. I can see that. Now, let me give it to you straight. We could produce oxygen and fresh water if we had power. The system works incredibly well, so long as the reactor does, too. But without it... Well, without it, we have only the air we're breathing. But that means... What it means is that in about... Twelve hours from now, unless the Admiralty can pull something out of the hat, we face a particularly hideous death from oxygen starvation. I suddenly understood the skipper's need for three fingers worth of scotch and help myself. What are the chances of anyone else picking up the Mayday? South Africans, for example. What good would it be? They're not equipped for this kind of situation. Ironic, isn't it, that this should happen on Christmas Eve? You're telling me. Robertson tells me we have around 12 hours worth of air left. That'll take us to the first hours of Christmas Day. I could think of better ways to spend it. Instructions were given to break out Christmas rations. Champagne, the works. The idea being to lull the men, hopefully, into a peaceful state, causing them to use less oxygen while we waited patiently, yet without hope, for a miracle. The ship was shut down. Only the dim glow from emergency lighting was in use. An eerie silence fell upon us, each man deeply involved with his own thoughts. The men knew the facts well enough by now, and it's an eternal credit to them and those who chose them that they kept their heads. The hours crept by. Three. Five. Eight. 
The air was now becoming fouler by the minute. Robertson had miscalculated. I... I don't think we... I don't think we have much longer, Sparks. Don't say that, Skipper. I dragged my oxygen-starved form to the transmitter and weakly punched out another mayday with what dwindling power was left in the ship's batteries. Don't waste your strength, Sparks. They... They know where we are. <coughs> they just can't get here in time. I painfully made my way down to the working deck with a vague notion of checking on the depth gauge. But I misjudged my reserves of strength and sank to my knees and slowly fell, wheezing for breath against a bulkhead. All around me, men were in a similar condition. And then I heard it. A single voice, barely above a whisper, began to sing. Suddenly I realised, looking at my watch, that Christmas Day was dawning. One by one, other voices picked up the carol until all who were able had joined in. Tears of frustration and irrational anger welled in my eyes. And then suddenly the now fervent voices were stilled by a frightening screeching whine which filled the ship. Drawn, anxious and expected faces turned toward me but I could offer no comfort. My guess was the reactor was on the verge of blowing up, and all I could do and did was pray for a peaceful end. terrifying noise continued and now seemed to come from different parts of the sub. I had no way of knowing what was happening, but instinct made me stagger and grope my way back to the bridge, gasping every inch of the way for want of air. Suddenly, as I drove my aching, oxygen-starved body past the now prone form of the depth controller, there came a sound of rending metal, a gush of water which was instantly replaced by a loud hissing. By now I was prepared to disbelieve my senses, but within a few seconds my ragged lungs confirmed that there was someone outside the sub, and it was now being pumped full of pure, sweet, life-giving air. I can't believe it, Sparks. The nearest British rescue vessel is still hours away. And he was right. But it didn't matter to us who our rescue was worse, so long as they succeeded. Within minutes, most of the crew had recovered sufficiently to report happenings in various parts of the ship. The sounds of divers in the regions of the vigilance planes and fins were heard, and shortly thereafter she began to make way. We're, we're moving, Sparks. They must be towing us. Anxious eyes were glued to the instruments. Very soon we found the vigilant gaining momentum and rising. Fifteen minutes later we were on the surface. No time was wasted in releasing the massive bolts holding the hatch in place. Willing hands above forced it open, flooding us with fresh salt air and the first glimpse of our rescuers. You should have told us you were coming. We would have been here sooner. Once on deck, we found ourselves flanked by two medium-sized submarines and being towed by a powerful tug, proudly flying South African colours. Allow me to introduce myself. Second Officer Harry von Bieren of the South African Navy at your service. ETA at Cape Town, where we might assist you with your reactor problems, is about, I would say, five hours from now. You, uh... You know about our problem. And your mission, Captain. There's very little we don't know about in this part of the world. But never mind that now. Let me be the first to wish you all welcome to South Africa and a very merry Christmas. High Adventure is produced by Henry Duffenthal.